Hi everybody, Steve Cady with Bowling Green State University and the Master of Organization Development Program. We have a series of webinars that we're doing on the art of conceptualization. Everybody out there, those of you on this webinar and lots of people around the world have concepts, have ideas, have a model, a methodology, an intellectual property, if you will, even a product. And in this case, we, we are tending to focus on on the conceptualization of models and methods that are more intellectual property oriented. And we're looking at how does a person take this cool idea, this cool concept that they have been able to use out in the world or are, are, are wanting to use out in the world and are beginning to create and build a, a framework and a method and a model so they can take it out into the world and do what they love doing and hopefully get paid doing it. And with that, uh, we have really been working to, to, in our program, help our students build a model, a framework that they can take out, building on all the knowledge they've been learning in the program, as well as the knowledge they've learned in their practice and profession and so forth coming into the program. And so it becomes a part of a project that the students are utilizing to help them build their model, their framework, and then be able to make a case in the world uh, for hiring them or getting promoted or whatever that next step might be. What's very important here is that you can have a great concept. You can have a great way in which you have done your work, your profession, whatever it is that you specialize in, whatever it is that passion is of yours, and you can be really great at it. And you could be thinking to yourself, well, how do I take this and bottle it? How do I scale it? How do I help others understand what it is I do? And how do I help them to understand it and adopt it and utilize it in their work or to have me help them? with this particular approach that I use or my way of doing things. And so what the art of conceptualization is about is taking that great idea, making it accessible, making it scalable, and then lending itself to a community of practice supporting that framework, that model that you use, whatever it might be. And so what we're doing today is we're looking at one, one part of the conceptualization process called the verbal persuasion Piece. There's three V's when you build a model. There's the verbal, there's the visual, and there's the visceral. And today we're going to focus on the verbal. We already have part one of the webinar series, which focused on what are models, how do we move from generic to applied models, and we began to introduce the verbal persuasion. I'm going to review that quickly and then jump right in, and we're going to focus today on verbal persuasion. As we do that, I'm really curious about questions out there and what kinds of things intrigue you and what questions you bring today. So Aaron, I'm curious for you, what, what intrigues you about today's session? Uh, what's a question that you bring? Just some different strategies and uh, getting your point across, your ideas across, making sure your audience understands what you're talking about. Okay. And tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I work as um, a continuous improvement leader for the Andersons in Maumee, Ohio. And what, and with continuous improvement in the work that you do, um, have you been thinking about a framework, a model, a, an approach that you want to bring to the Andersons or bring to the work that you do to make it scalable well, so that other people can adopt and do and repeat that? That's definitely a key part is developing training that's, um, you know, there's a large workforce to cover and develop their skills so they can, can go and do um, and not just be a, a corporate resource, but actually build the skill set of continuous improvement across the company. So that's what I wanted to, to learn a little bit more about today. Great. Okay, excellent. And John, how about you? What, what intrigues you today? What question do you bring? What intrigued me about today was the support that we got for our first session. Um, and that someone else already put it in the chat room. It was uh, Katie that verbal persuasion, especially in presentations, is always a place for improvement. And I really, uh, that comment really resonated with me. And so it's just, even as we grow and, and we know things and we learn certain things, um, in terms of better presenting our ideas, especially mouth-to-mouth, uh, -mouth, face face-to-face, and online, there's always tips, tricks, and tools that we can learn. Um, so that's what questions I bring today. Great. Well, thank you. And as you can see, the purpose today is about uh, helping you to bring that model to life, making it accessible. That's really key. 
People need to understand what it is you offer in order to be able to use what you offer. You could have a great idea and it's not accessible. People can't understand it and they end up not utilizing something that could really help them. So the first step is, is figuring out what you love and connecting that to a model or framework that you want to bring out to the world in your practice and your and however you define how big the world is, but in your profession, your company, your, your community. Once you do that, you've got to make it accessible. Once you make it accessible, you got to figure out how to then keep it being scaled and building that community of practice. And today we're going to focus on the three V's and the first of the three V's, V's being verbal persuasion. The second is vis, uh, visual and the, and the third is visceral. So with that, I just want to, we've got some people that are in the chat rooms. I'm going to jump over and we're going to jump in, but I just want to make sure people have been able to jump over to Chatsy and chat and ask questions and, and pose their comments and have a parallel conversation with us. Just go over to tinyurl.com for slash Steve Katie webinar. Your screen, you can hold up the viewer that you're looking at and Chatsy. So with that, let's go ahead and let's jump right in to, to the presentation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very quick overview of what we talked about in part one. It's going to be very fast. For those of you that are listening, going, hey, wait, 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 slow down. I'm intentionally going fast because there's a whole hour that we have of a webinar that focused just on the front end of this as part one. So again, building models that work. And that's where we talk about create an idea, create an idea. Then from creating the idea that you care about, it's making it accessible. Once you make it accessible, it's making it scalable. Once you make it scalable, it's building a community of practice around it. And that is a model that worked. And we talked about why build models. And I talked a lot about how these models are really about helping people feel smarter. And it's an art. Building models is, is both the left and right brain. But there's truly an art. And I think art kind of captures the essence of head and heart, left and right brain. And this process began as a just a really a simple idea. And, we, and, and in my work with my graduate program and the change handbook and a few of the other things, what I found was that there's a there's a process by which people can build models that fundamentally help you to be more confident in doing what you care about doing. And there's a simple way and process by which you can go through building your model. We talked about generic versus applied. A generic model is something that you're creating right now. Those of you who are out there are thinking about this. You're creating a generic model that can be a white paper, and eventually it'll become an applied model. And that means a customized model for any particular situation you use it in. So we all take and build generic models, make them accessible, make them scalable, and build a community practice around them so that community practice can apply them in very uh, specific situations. We talked about how a lot of times in building your model, here's the thing that's that's really important for you to, to, to be mindful of. When you build a model, a lot of times you built it inductively. It's a discovery process. You're discovering what you're good at. You're experiencing all kinds of phenomenon out there and there's symptoms and there's patterns. And out of that, you start seeing a repeated pattern that lends itself to you saying, wait a second, I think I can duplicate this. I think I can create a solution for it. I think I can create some type of consistent framework, which sometimes lends itself to a book or to an article or to a presentation or to something. And that becomes your model, which then moves from the daily affairs to now understanding it, which is over on the right, because then you can start test, researching it, testing it, looking at causes, indications, and solutions and applying it, and then come pop back around as you then begin to look at the phenomena, experience symptoms, and continue the revision process. Here's the interesting thing. If I were to tell you how to bake a cake, and if they do it on TV shows, they don't start with here's flour and here's how flour is made. Here's butter and here's how butter is made. Here's sugar and here's how sugar is made. Here's yeast and here's this and here's that and here's this and here's this. And start showing you all these ingredients and talking about how they were discovered and how they were made and how somehow the stuff came together and did this and did this and, the t and so forth. And eventually a cake was made and then they show you the cake. You know, so they could take a five hour show and show you how they got to make it a cake. And then the last hour, show you the cake. And you're like going, geez, you lost me in the first four hours. You lost me in the first hour because I was just, I just get, you know, get to the end result. What they do a lot of times is they show you the final product and then they deconstruct it and show you how they made it. So a lot of times in building your model, building your generic model, it's important to recognize it as you begin to write it up and create it and make it accessible to the world. You're writing it deductively, whereas you built it inductively. 
And so it's so you present it as a final solution and then support it in how you made it and define and describe and so forth. So with that, how do you go about describing it and telling the story and presenting it to people? There's lots of different ways. You've heard of, you know, verbal. You've heard of an active. You've heard of kinetic learning, verbal learning, auditory learning. Uh, visual learning and those kinds of things. Well, this is this verbal, visual, and visceral kind of captures that. The verbal is the auditory and the text-based learning. The visual is seeing it. The visceral is feeling it and 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 and, and practicing with it and acting with it. And then pain and pleasures is is distributed throughout verbal, visual, and visceral. It happens throughout all of that. You can tell a good story and someone can cringe. You can see something and cringe. You can enact something and cringe. So pain and pleasure, the physiological arousal, plays a role in all of that. And so what you want to do is focus on, on presenting your model, touching on all four of those. And our focus today is going to be actually on verbal persuasion. The focus of the series is going to be on verbal, visual, visceral, with physiological, physiological arousal being embedded in the first three. So what questions are out there? I'm going to keep going, but right off the bat, I'm going to ask, jump in with Aaron. Aaron, what questions do you have, and, and are you all seeing any questions out there in the chat? I just think it's neat, the correlation of the, uh, the model building cycle in the same way we do continuous improvement. Look at, uh, you know, you have a problem or a symptom and uh, work towards a root cause and, and then corrective action, but the... It's, it's a very similar process to what we do here. It's just a new way to look at it and maybe a better way for, to help people understand it. Right. And, and in continuous improvement, the way you came to the solution and enacted that solution, sometimes when you do your presentation to others to report on the project or the continuous improvement initiative, sometimes you want to present it to others deductively, not present it inductively with all the story. You kind of kind of summarize, give the executive summary, lay it out and deconstruct it. Do you follow how that you can have you seen people fall in that trap of wanting to tell the whole story of how they got to the conclusions and this and that when people are like, wait a second, I wasn't in all that. Just tell me the solution and then let me ask questions about how you got there. Right. Just, you know, tell them what time it is, not how you made the watch. Yeah. Right. Right. And so telling them what time it is is deduction. And then you can break down how the watch was made to tell that time or inductively go through the ex describing the experience of building the watch and, and then time. Right on. John, are you seeing anything out there in uh, chat land? Uh, nothing in chat land yet. Okay, so for you all out there, as you listen and as you have questions or a good example, please let us know, and we'll keep rolling along. So let's talk about verbal. That's our focus today. And we're going to be looking at, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think of verbal. You can think of it as hearing. You can think of it as writing, reading, discussion, debating. But it's all got the, the, the core element. Is, is the notion of words that really in a lot of times have text-based elements to it. And that's what we're going to focus on is the text-based element to the verbal persuasion. And verbal persuasion focuses on learning by definition. And what learning by definition gets at is, is it really looks at when you think about your particular idea. And I'd like to invite all of you out there to think about that thing that you want to communicate to others. What is that model? What is that method? What is that approach you'd like to communicate and engage others around that you care about? And it could be pick something small, pick a concept, pick a presentation, pick the one thing that you are starting to formulate a little model around that people can use to help them do something. And remember, models that work. And so as you think about it, think about what it is. Think about what it looks like and who and what interacts with it, how it behaves, why it is important and how to use it. And, and so when you think about that, and then you're gonna be thinking about what are some tips and tricks for applying it. And so as you think about this, uh, the, the definition is really getting at this notion of what it is. And so I'd like for you all out there to, to identify an it. And we're gonna use that as a practice today as we walk through this discussion. So a definition is necessary because Sometimes a word or a concept has more than one meaning. And so what you're doing in your model, and this is key, you're going to create a model and you might ask yourself, you might say to others, or they might say to you, well, how is that different from, how is your model different from continuous improvement? And Aaron, you might be saying, well, I've got a unique twist. So you're using some similar labels or words, but you're, you're defining them a little bit differently. 
and you're weaving words together to make the model in a different way that you feel will make a better impact or, a, or an impact on the environment you're working in in a better way. A screwdriver turned into a Phillips head screwdriver. It's similar, but it's different. And so you've got to try to find ways to describe how your tool, your model is being used in a special way. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is you define your concepts, this it that you're defining, it should be complete enough to include, include all the items, yet enough to eliminate others. So if you're working, Aaron, on continuous improvement in a particular unique model of continuous improvement, you need to be clear to include all the key elements and terms and, and concepts that will fit in there. So you have your model as a main model, and then you have your sub models or your smaller tools, a big tool and a small set of tools that kind of fit together into a coherent framework. And it should be such that when someone looks at it, they know what it is and what's in that wheelhouse and what's not from continuous improvement that fits into the, to the framework that you're creating. So you gotta know what it is, but also what it is not. And so the, the idea is not to make a perfect definition. It's about making practical definitions. And it, it talks here about a good definition should include a general classification of a term plus a specific characteristics of that term. So as you're defining your concept, you want to have a general classification of the term plus a specific characteristic that differentiates the term from other members in its class. We're going to talk about more of that in just a second. And you want your definitions to be thoughtful and accurate. And, and the reason being is people, you got to remember people going to look at your stuff without you being there to explain. And the better you're able to explain it and in writing and provide enough uh, elaboration so that people can understand it, that's important without being exhaustive. And they help people when they're reading it to know where they are. And that's where the good the notion of road signs. It helps them know where they're in the model, where they're in parts of the model, how they relate to each other and how to utilize it. Um, and a lot of times verb uh, definitions require a, a simple present simple tense and a verb to be. And so definitions can um, can can really will typically incorporate that notion of simple present simple tense and verb to be, and the definite article the is usually not used with the term being defined because definitions are generally statements. So let me show you here what we're talking about. You got the term is equal to a general class word plus specific characteristics, and you don't you know you don't see it's the it's not the it's an a and so forth. So an astronomer is, general class, a scientist who, and you get into your verb, studies the universe. A barometer is, a general class, an instrument. Now you're trying to get it, got to help it to be different, that measures air pressure. Conduction is a process by which heat is transferred. So you can see this notion of general class plus specific characteristics that help it to become unique. And you can see the verb built in, and you don't see the, you know? You can see down there the study, but the physics, the conduction, and so forth. Now, sentence patterns, you can, here, here's some more examples here. Mercury, a triangle, asbestos, a dinosaur, a monkey, is a, you can do sp sp specific characteristics, then the general class. So it doesn't have to be general class, then specifics. It can be a reverse. Mercury is a liquid, three-sided, fire-resistant, prehistoric, small, long-tailed. So a monkey, a small, long-tailed primate. Dinosaur, prehistoric reptile. Asbestos is a fire-resistant mineral. The general class is last, whereas the, the specific characteristics are first. And a triangle is a three-sided plane figure. And mercury is a liquid metal. So, so as you think about your it, the thing that you have, try right now jotting down on a piece of paper next to you or, or in however you take notes and think about, to pick one item, and, or, or, and I really think two that fit into your model and see if you can define those two terms in such a way that you can tell them apart from each other, even though they're in the same category or in the same element of your, or area of your model, for example. And Aaron, I'm going to ask you and put you on the spot a little bit if you can maybe think of something in continuous improvement, two terms that are sort of 
related but distinct and how you can create a definition kind of using some of these concepts. And I'll check in with you, John, as well and see if you're up for the up for the challenge. So, and I'm going to give you some time to think about it. So as you're all out there, if you can do that and if you can do it in the chat room and put some definitions in there, let's kind of test them out. Let's start practicing and as you are starting right now to define the, define the terms and the concepts in your methodology or your model that you're creating. The characteristics could precede the class, as mentioned. So, example, potential ener energy is stored energy. Term, potential energy, characteristics, stored, class, energy. So you can, you know, energy, stored, stored energy is potential energy. You can even do it in reverse if you wanted in terms of sometimes of different creative writings and so forth. I think you all are starting to get this this notion of knowing the term, the characteristics, and the class, and how you can mix and match that to meet the needs as you define your concepts. Now, your turn. Aaron, what are your thoughts? Do you have a couple concepts that, that you, you would uh, throw out there for us to think about? Um, maybe uh, you know, visual management is a, is a communication technique. So it's one way, it's, it's a technique, but the key is that you know, the literal term is for communicating. That'd be one of them. So visual, so how do you, if you say visual communication. V visual it, management. Vis, visual, man, say it again. Visual management. Okay, is a what? A communication technique. Technique. And so it's, uh, and is there, where is, where would you say is the, the term is visual management. What's the characteristic? The characteristic. And I'll go back here. Kind of think like that. Is a. Communication would be the characteristic. Okay. And general class is technique. Correct. I think okay. so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. And you might even ha want to further define what you mean by technique, if there is a certain certain aspect to the technique or some, a unique a unique way of saying the word technique that's beyond. You could say it's a, um, well, maybe somebody out there in, in chat land can actually help help us think about that. But I think you're right on track. John, did okay. you have anything you wanted to, to try out? Um, I, I was looking at that and I was toying with um, the, the word integration. And so if you, could bring that, if you could bring the slide back, if we look at integration as a term, I would say that integration is a process as the general class, and then the specific characteristics would be it would be a process by which bring uh, things together. Right. Right. So, so integration is a process by which you bring things together. Things are brought together. So good, good. Now, that's, those are some good examples. What's happening out there in chat land? Is there anything out there? No, not yet. Okay. Any questions out there? No? Nope. Okay. Maybe they need uh, motivation. What's that? Maybe they need some motivation to go well, into the chat. Yeah, so let's let's... Uh, yeah, I think are you do you have the uh, mini iPad that you're willing to give away for the person who chats the most? Right. Yeah. So let's look at some different kinds of definitions. We talked you know broadly about this the, the 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 elements of a definition and so forth. Now let's talk about these six types of definition that go into um, making great definitions. So there's logical definition. So as you Think of a logical definition. It's a it, the logical definition distinguishes an item from others like it. So a beret is a cap that is flat, round, and usually made of felt. Plague is a disease that is a persistent epidemic. Friend is a person to whom we feel close. And so, so a beret is a cap. So it's like a cap. Plague is like a disease. A friend is a person. Now, how do we make it different from the cap or other caps? How do we make plague different from other diseases? How do we make a friend different from other people? And so that's where we, we talk about whom we feel close, persistent epidemic, 
flat brown and usually made of felt. So that's the first. So again, I'll, I'll check in and ask people out there, can you make a definition, pick your key, a key word that's in your model and something you're thinking about? Uh, I know Al Watts is out there. I know you got your work on integrity. You might take a couple of your definitions and be willing to share some of that with us um, and how you've created some of the definitions within your model. Um, we've got other stuff. Is there anything, Aaron, that you'd want to uh, try to utilize here? I take it. Okay. So, Aaron, I'm. There's a couple things in the chat room. What's that? There's a couple things in the chat room. Great. Uh, Nicholas wrote the term was uh, change management. He said, change is the class and management is the process. Okay. And if change management was the term, then what would be the class and what would be the process? And how is change management? Change management is a organizational improvement approach that focuses on, so how can you have change management be defined in a way that differentiates it from OD, human resources, training and development? Anybody else out there have something? John? And Sherry said planned communication is a powerful form of OD. Okay. Okay. Definition by negation. So think about it this way. You can take your same definitions and say, how do we define it by what it is not? So FM radio is the opposite of AM. Chinese is not at all like English. A friend won't let you down. Any thoughts out there on that one? And Aaron, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know you weren't expecting this. So That's okay. So process, if you were to, how do you, how do you differentiate process improvement from change management or from OD or from, or do you not? Or how do you define it in a way that process, you know, process improvement is, how do you define it in a way that by negation, how might you define it? Um, it's sometimes we'll use the, uh, you know, process improvement is not, uh, Unilaterally communicated. It's 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 collaborative. You know, explain that put people at ease that what this is what it's not, but do it deliberately to uh, make sure that they know they're going to be involved and, and be able to share their ideas. Right. So you can have a definition uh, by lo logical definition, and then you can follow up. You can follow up by saying what it's not. So just so people can know, like you said, you can say it is not a a what did you say? It is not what? It's not unilateral. It's, it's not top-down driven. It's, it's integrated from, from the employee level. There you go. So you can see how you're, you're beginning to define it. So a definition, when you define something, can be multiple sentences, as you, which then, then becomes a description of the concept. So you can define it first. You know, can have a logical definition. Then it can flow into describing what it's not. So again, as you're trying to think about how do I describe my concept, don't think of it as one sentence. Think of it as these are different ways in which you can build a paragraph or more than a paragraph as you describe your what it is your concept is. So think of definition, you know, sometimes as more than a sentence, and it's 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 describing the terms and concepts of your model or methodology. So you can begin to discuss what it's not. You can also start discussing how it operates. So here's another way to describe that element. You can, uh, how something works or what it's used for. So then you can talk about a rolling pin is for flattening dough. And so while you can describe what process improvement is not, you can also begin to talk about what it is because you just did that, right, Aaron? You said it's not unilateral, it is collaborative. A Dutch door lets the outside air in but keeps animals out. You see that? So what it is versus what it is not. A friend will be there when you need her. So Aaron, what are your thoughts on, on that as you think about kind of your area of work? And John? If you guys are talking. 
you're on mute. So both of you are on mute, I think. Oh, sorry. Um, it makes a lot of sense, though, when you have a uh, an abstract uh, concept like continuous improvement. Well, what does that mean to people? So the better you can define it, the more effective you're going to be. When you, right. When so you, you try to go mean. back and you kind of give it a logical definition and you can describe it logically and lay it out. Then you can describe what it's not and then you can give it describe how it operates. Right. And right. then you can go to, you know, defining it more in elaborating with the description and the observable attributes of it. So not only can we describe it operationally when it's working, see, but here's an interesting thing. Operationally, a rolling pin is used for flattening dough. So what is process lean improvement used for? That means what kind of things do we do with it to help improve the organization's operations? And so the next thing a person is going to say, hey, describe what that looks like. And I, as I mentioned, I use the word kind of description broadly. But here, what description is referring to is, can you describe? The next thing is, okay, great. Aaron, I want to do this. We want to do process improvement. You've talked about, give them, I, got, I understand what it is. I understand what it's not. I understand the impact it will have on, on what we're trying to do, how it's used to help us improve our operations. You know, remove waste, increase cycle, uh, reduce cycle time increase quality, you know, those kinds of things. And as a result, I'm going to say, okay, great. Well, what does it look like when you do it? Where, where do we start? What does it look like? Right. And then you begin to describe the observable, observable attributes. Like a penguin is a bird with short wings and webbed feet. A clarinet is a long black woodwind instrument. A friend is someone who really talks to you. So in this sense here, what you got is is a description of what it looks like. And you got to bring it to life for them by describing it. And, and a lot of times when you're describing your model, describe it so that if you're not there, a person can duplicate it. So if you have a recipe for something that you're making <coughs> and the process by which you make it is really important. You can't just throw all a bunch of stuff together and just throw it in the oven and it pops out great. You've got to do things in a certain way, in a certain order, and you got to have, and there's very specific instructions. So a definition by description can, you can have a broad definition by description, but describing kind of what process improvement looks like and, and what does it look like when you apply it and what, is, what does it mean kind of briefly. But as you begin to build your model out, you're going to get into the details of what it looks like so that a person can read what you've provided and duplicate it. That's really, really important. John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I like that. Um, I w I'm wondering when defining and when putting together your presentation, um, is it a good best practice to combine definitions and do s and then do certain terms only lend themselves to different types of definitions, or is it you know how how do you go about that process? Well, I think that you, you talked about presentation. I, I, I think what you'll find is that all these are different ways of beginning to elaborate on the, con, the main model and the sub-models and the sub-sub-models, all these elements and terms and concepts and how they're woven together. And so um, you'll be using all of it, I think, in any of your descriptions. As you begin to use all these, you're providing a level of detail that will help a person understand how what it is why it's important, and how to apply it or how to do it themselves. And the best way to know where and what definitions, because you can overdefine, as we talked about, the best way, I think, is, is done through presentation. If I could give any uh, very simple, what I think might be observable uh, or, or obvious um, piece of advice, it is to put, your pre put what it is, your model together, and make a presentation and teach it to others as a workshop, even bring friends together into your living room and present it, uh, and then get them to give you feedback. Watch them interact with it. Sometimes write it up. After you write it up, sit them down and have them read it and sit there and watch them read it. As you see them reading, they'll ask, ask a question and you'll kind of jot down. They'll debate with you and not agree with something. And it's not because it's a bad idea, but maybe they haven't quite understood it yet. This is going back to accessibility. So then you begin to use you begin to think, well, I need to define what this is not because everybody keeps thinking process improvement is the way management forces things on us. They keep saying that, but in my description, 
in my in the description of the the approach we're taking, I don't say what it's not. So maybe I need to say it is not these things. You know, a lot of times in books they'll use the notion of myths. So they do myths to help set up what things are not. So I think you got to test it out. And my best advice is to present it to others. Write it up and have others read it and watch them while they're doing it. As they're reacting in your presentations and reacting while they're reading it, it's telling you where to elaborate, where to add different types of definitions. They'll ask you for the definition that they need. Aaron, any reflections on, as, as, as we're going here? Just uh, you know, observable attributes got me thinking. Engaged employees, you'd want to see, see a, a continuous improvement suggestions, the visual workplace. Those are the kind of things you could help, you know, if people are visual learners anyway, help them visualize what, what are we talking about for, for this concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I hope everybody out there that's, that's listening in, that you're seeing that as you describe and bring something together, these are all different ways to help you. If you're sitting there thinking, what do I write about it? I've already, I think I've said enough. Hopefully you're seeing these are different ways you can begin to describe. Yeah, John? Uh, this um, Al is in the chat room, and I think that he wants to uh, make a comment. If you could unmute him, maybe. Yeah. Um, can uh, you can you unmute him? Yeah. Give me just a second. And so. I think we can, we can, until Al jumps in, I can keep going and yep. then. Al, can you hear us? I can hear you fine. I'm not sure if you can hear me though. Oh, I can hear you great. You sound very clear, Al. Hi, it's nice to see you. I was going to oh. call you. I was getting ready to call you this morning. I had another call I had to make. So I was going to check in with you and see how you were doing and how the residency just went. So I'm glad to um, say hi to you now and want to chat with oh, you well. later at some point. Thank you. I spent the last 20 minutes trying to get uh, completely connected. So here I am. Thank you. Cool. So was there something you wanted to share and some reactions or observations from what you've heard? Oh, no, so far so good. Mainly I was trying to get connected and John, I think you helped me do that. So okay. carry on. Okay, cool. So um, I might call, I might, as you're listening, I might uh, come back to you because I think you, 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 your integrity model and the book that you created, uh, you wrote is uh, a great example of taking a concept and making it accessible to others and building your model around it based on all your years of practice. You inductively built that book and then the, turned the book into a deductive presentation of what you know so others can use it. So I think that's great. So I'll, I'll check in with you, Al, and see what your thoughts are as we go. So let's look at the next Thanks, one. Thank you. A definition by metaphor. And metaphor is, I love this. There's a, a company locally called Root Learning, and I love when they say, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, when you look at um, a metaphor is, uh, I'm trying to think of how they said this. And let me come back to it because I can't remember right now because they used metaphor and a picture is a thousand metaphors. But anyway, so a figure of speech in which a word or phrase, meaning one kind of object or idea, is used to, in place of another to suggest a similarity between them. And so a ship plows through the sea, war is hell, a friend is one's greatest treasure. So you can see how this notion of a ship, you can, you, it helps make the point of it plowing. Ships don't plow. Plows work in farm fields. But a ship plows through the sea. War is hell. You know, and, and 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 someone might argue that it really is. And someone might say, well, war, you know, and it, it, it gets really at that notion, that metaphor of hell really helps to define what war is to that person. Or a friend is one's greatest treasure. A treasure is something, you know, that's different. But when you think of using it with this concept, it helps to really bring it to life. And, and, and this is where I talk about, you know, when you think about the three V's plus the plus the third, the physiological arousal, as you think about some of these, it can touch you in a way that actually starts to begin to get at that, that, that physiological arousal. And, and in the root learning example, it was, I, I believe they said a metaphor is worth a thousand words and a picture is worth a thousand metaphors. And that's when we get to the visual element of the three Vs. Right now we're focusing on verbal. So this is getting us there and metaphors get us close to that visual. And you, as you can see, a ship plows through the sea. War is hell. Friends, one's greatest treasure. 
Uh, any thoughts, Aaron? And you're on mute if you're talking. Um, my job could be an uphill battle. It sure can. <laughs> Just my job could be an uphill battle. Yeah. Hey, hey, and you're 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 in our graduate program in the Mass Organization Development Program. So, a being a student is what is like what? It, it's fun so far. Wow, oh, come on. There's got to be a good metaphor there. So Al might, Al might have a good metaphor. If you have one, I'll throw one in. Or John, you might have one. Do you, either of you have one? Or anybody out there in chat land have a good metaphor? Which I'm really curious. What are some favorite metaphors out there in chat land? It's like sliding. It's like being in school is like sliding down a razor sharp rainbow. That is just weird. Is Al, do you have correct? one? Yes. Al, do you have one? A favorite metaphor, Al? And you're, you might be on mute. Okay, so if anyone has one out there, John, just interrupt me. But uh, I think, you're, John, your creativity okay, is... Okay, I, I think I'm back now. Yep. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Oh, okay. Here's a metaphor I use in my book. I talk about the importance of core values. And the metaphor I use is that core values are like a ship's keel. They keep you uh, going back to your plowing through the sea. That's what keeps a sailboat upright. Yeah. Right. So that's Steve here. This is from Ron Kohler. Um, I just want to make sure that people know Ron said it, not John. Change readiness is like marriage readiness. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, cool. So you all are seeing that. And, and these help to really bring it to life. It doesn't get as close to the, it doesn't make it the visual, but it starts to get close to visual. As I was saying, metaphor is worth a thousand words and a visual, a picture is worth a, a thousand metaphors. Um, so as we go, we got the last one here and, and Al, I'm, I'll be, I'll come to you on this in just a second. And, and Aaron, and for those of you out there, what's your favorite quote for all of you out there in chat land, what's your favorite quote that you learn from a person who mentored you to a family member to something you read, a quote that really influences you. And, um, and, and so you get definition by quote uses a well put words of others to define. So old men are children for a second time. Ambition is a soldier's virtue. A fool at 40 is a fool indeed. And you can use quotes to help give credibility to something. You can give quotes to help elaborate and help give another perspective or say in a different way. Um, you can give quotes to to really encourage people and so forth. So I think what's what's important here is is that you can use quotes uh, and for a variety of purposes. Um, my dad, you know, um, used a quote to make a point, a very poignant point to all of us as kids, because we would say, "Dad, but I thought." My dad would say, what? He'd go, you know what thought did? And I'd say, what? And then I finally knew better. He goes, thought, thought it farted, but it pooped its pants. Okay. So you, and I've never forgotten that as long as I'm alive. So, I mean, quotes are sometimes something that really makes a point. Uh, Aaron, what about you? Do you have your favorite quote? One of my favorites, it kind of ties into today, the Abraham Lincoln, if I had five hours to sharpen or to uh, cut down a tree, I'd spend the first hour sharpening the axe. That's a really good one. Yeah, that's a great one. Al, do you have a favorite quote? Can you hear me? Yep. Well, first of all, I have thousands that I've used in presentations, but speaking of Abraham Lincoln, one of my favorites is when he said, sorry for the length of this letter. If I had more time, I would have written you a shorter one. Yep, right on. That is so true. And John, how about you? I don't have one. How All about right. out there in chat land? Yeah, uh, Ron Kohler, new quote discovered today to counter. Um, it said, nothing endures change. Nothing endures but change. Hmm. I have two that I think relate to change that I have found really, really helpful. One is if you if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Oh yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, and and um, 
there's another one about change about and, and speed. Um, but th that's, there's a couple like that, that I think a lot of times help to make the point and help to get people to be more open to your model or to a principle or something along those lines. You know, it, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, what's the other one? You got to go slow to go fast is another one. Sometimes you got to go slow to go fast. And that goes back to Aaron, your part about sharpening the ax, right? So those are some good ones. And if anybody has any out there, I'd love to hear more of those. So are there any questions that you all have as we listen to what we've talked about today? Uh, I'll start with John. Are there any questions that you have or questions that you're seeing out there in, in chat land? Uh, Ron Kohler asked who, who was the, the, the last quote you had, who was that by? And Katie put in the chat room, be the change you want to see in the world. Which is Gandhi, um, and, yeah. Any questions right now? Okay. Okay. Al, any, any questions that you have right now? Well, the main question I have is going way back to what I heard in the first part of your presentation, how I can be more explicit about what exactly the organizational integrity model is and what it would do for people. And that's just something I have to keep working on. Yeah, so that's, that's the question you're pondering is helping it to be more explicit and so forth, yeah. And there's another set of webinars we're going to do around the six design elements, and I was I had some reflections on that in your in your book and stuff based on some of our conversations. I'm looking forward to our next conversation that we have one on one. Cool, Aaron. How about you? Any questions you have? No, not any questions. I think this will be really useful to help define a concept so that you can define its value, which is really what we want to do. Um, to so people want they have the understanding and they see a reason to apply it. Mm -hmm. Great. And so when you think about your audience, going back to what I talked about earlier, if you create your model, your framework so that it works, that means you're creating something that connects to your passion, that becomes a, a model or a method or a tool or an approach that is accessible to others, that becomes scalable, i.e. that others can help others with it and that you can build a community of practice around. And in doing all of that, you can have presentations, you can have books, you can have webinars, you can have workshops, you can have all kinds of different things that you can utilize to bring it to the audience, the people that you hope will adopt the model, the method, the approach that you're creating. And so having the utmost amount of respect for your readers and I have found this, and this is something that has been advice given to me, that you know, rebellion, uh, resistance, um, strong reactions to are all information. Resistance is information that helps you to sharpen your model, your method. So when someone doesn't like it, when someone reacts strongly, think about it like this. If they react strongly to it, maybe there's something really positive in that if you can figure out what it is they're reacting strongly to and what your model, method, or approach is is uh, providing. So watch how people react. Do the presentations. Listen to the questions they ask. When they ask questions, it gives you a sense of which parts of the definition you need to spend more time on. Because remember, definition is a big, a big elaboration in one sense. And what I mean by big, it's not like overly big, meaning it's more than one sentence. It's paragraphs. It's, it's, it's multiple paragraphs with headers and subheaders as you describe your overarching model, then the sub-elements of your model, and then the sub-sub-elements. And you'll find yourself usually operating in levels of three. And so as you're listening to your readers, they'll tell you where you need to say more, where you need to provide more examples of, by negation or by operation or by description. And um, don't confuse them with undefined terms. So if there are undefined terms in your audience out there, and if there's some things that are not defined out there, don't confuse the terms that you're using. Don't confuse them with undefined terms. If someone's asking a question and they're confused, try to figure out what they're talking about and really ask a lot of questions because it's probably what they're, they're talking about things that it's not, which may be a definition by negation and it's helping you figure out what how to define what yours is versus what it is not. And sometimes there's undefined things out there. And so as you're listening, 
Um, don't confuse your definition and your definitions with undefined terms. And also suit the definitions to particular audiences. So a lot of times you, you'll also find yourself creating your generic model, but you might have a version that's well-suited for healthcare and a, and a model that's well-suited for um, high tech. Uh, maybe not, but sometimes your definitions are good for particular audiences. Here's one thing that I think is really interesting. It's the labels oftentimes that are different. Now take this, uh, and a lot of you know this, take this to the bank here. A lot of times you'll have some key terms. You walk into an organization and they don't call it the same thing. They don't, they don't have the same term for what you're, what you're describing. So sometimes your definition has a different label in a certain organization. So I often describe myself as being a definition in search of labels. I walk in with my models and my methods. That's where you go from generic to applied. Go in with my generic model. And all of a sudden they say, we don't call that core values. We call that, um, we call that not core values, we call that principles. Oh, we don't call that um, process improvement. We call that continuous improvement. You know, so a lot of times what you got to do is not to walk in with your, your generic model and force it on your client or force it on people. Listen to them and they might tell you different ways to adapt it so that it can fit for a particular application, which goes from generic to applied. So with that, I think we're done. I'm going to check in with uh, Aaron, then Al, and then John and our group out there, and then we will be done. So, Aaron, what um, I'm going to go back to that here in just a second. Aaron, what are what are some of your um, thoughts as we wrap up? Just really helpful, Steve. Uh, suit your definitions. We have a hundred locations: uh, rail, bake, uh, retail stores, grain, a fertilizer. So making those metaphors applicable, making those definitions make sense to different groups is definitely a good idea. Great. Al, how about you? Yeah, uh, helpful stuff. I, I am, as you know, still in search of the right language that will quickly send the message integrity is more than just about ethics and morality. You know, I use it as that central concept. So this has given me some new tools to, to uh, keep working on that. Great. John, how about you? I appreciate these six different types of definitions and then the, the, the model in the beginning that kind of helped to try to simplify and, and class out the beginnings of your definitions. And then the last part you said about when you're walking into organizations um, or two different organizations might have different definitions for the same term. That's really impactful for me to think about and to remember when uh, out doing client work. Great. Great. Any, anybody out there in the chat room that has anything to say? Uh, Sherry said it was a great webinar. She put some quotes of a link that she had for uh, Women's Day. Uh, Ron Kohler said very thought-provoking. Thanks. Mel B. said thanks. Uh, Katie said so often I try to boil down a definition to be as brief as possible. I like the various types of definitions um, and some of that connect with many different people. Cool. Great. So as we wrap up, you know, it can be as little as a sentence, as one person said, or as much as a book, as Al has. Uh, it, you can think of an extended definition uh, is, is really putting all and weaving all these things in to, to create a comp to describe a complex concept. And, you know, you've got all these different pieces and elements. So it's, it's really think of the extended definition as your white paper, as your presentation, as your book. And we've just now finished talking about verbal persuasion. We've talked about the verbal element of creating a generic model. There is also visual and visceral that we'll be talking about next in, a part, in part three and part four of this webinar series. So I invite you to come back and join us at, in a future, on our next webinar. This will be recorded and made available. And as we check out here, just want to draw your attention to, we have um, we've talked a little bit about a bumper sticker gestalt already, and that is just one word or key phrase that captures how you, how you are as you leave. We have another webinar coming up on change interaction, change the results, four keys that change everything with Judith Katz and Fred Miller. They are awesome in, in their professional work. You, many of you know of them, and they have several books out and are very accomplished thought leaders in our field. And that'll be on March 28th at 12 p.m., and you can register right there. And if you go to uh, Nexus for Change, 
org or com, you will see a link there to sign up for the webinar. And we'll be a webinar survey coming out at the end here. And so I invite you to take a few minutes to fill that out. Please just click yes. It takes about three minutes and it helps us know what we can do to improve things with you all. So with that, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Aaron, for being a spontaneous participant on our panel. And Al, you too. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. And uh, John, thanks for being our chat room facilitator. Is there any closing comments from you all? Well, thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks a lot, Steve, and participants. Very helpful. Great. Steve, well, thanks a lot for putting this together. Um, we'll have, as a follow-up, we will send out the recording to this session and then the links to our next three sessions. And so our next session on conceptualizing change is coming up next week um, on March 11th. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for now, and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye for now.